All right, so we just finished up accounting for all the ATPs that are generated during cellular respiration. Now, what is the absolute requirement for cellular respiration? In order for cellular respiration to continue, what do we need? That's not rhetorical. We're producing energy. I think oxygen. Yeah, we require oxygen. So we have to have a steady supply of oxygen. And for you and me as humans, how do we supply that oxygen? We breathe, right? <laughs> so we breathe the oxygen in, and as you take air in, it's about 16% oxygen. It goes through the circulatory system and eventually makes its way into the working tissue where it enters into the mitochondria, and that molecule of oxygen that you breathe in is what facilitates the continuation of electron transport chain. CO2 is produced. Where is the CO2 produced, by the way? What? CO2 is produced during pyruvate transport. Remember, we strip off the CO2, strip off an electron to produce an NADH, and put on that sulfur containing coenzyme A. Okay. So that CO2 begins to build up in the cell. Humans, we deposit that out into the blood, circulates to the lungs, and expire that back out. So we're going to require this constant supply of oxygen. However, there are many situations where oxygen supply will fall short, or will be in short supply, or it may even be non-existent at all. So in humans, most of the time, oxygen concentrations drop with exercise or inadequate breathing. But for other organisms, they may live in an environment where there isn't oxygen or very little oxygen, such as um, organisms that live uh, in um, the, the sea vents, the vents down at the bottom of the, of the ocean. So fortunately, if oxygen is not supplied, we still have an ability to generate some ATP. So we still have the ability to continue to produce ATP, even though oxygen is no longer available in adequate, uh, adequate concentration. Now, when you look at cellular respiration, there are basically three components to cellular respiration. Glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. The Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain both will shut down or at least greatly reduce their production of ATP when we reduce oxygen supply. But glycolysis is unaffected by oxygen supply. So when you look at cellular respiration, glycolysis is frequently referred to as the anaerobic portion of cellular respiration. You don't need oxygen for glycolysis. So glycolysis still operates. And so what that means is that that production of ATP in glycolysis, what do we call that? <laughs> glycolysis is being produced in the glycolytic pathway or the level of the substrate. Substrate level phosphorylation. So glycolysis still operates and through substrate level phosphorylation I actually generate two ATP, a net of two ATP. I still have to put the two in during investment phase, and then through steps six through ten, I get the four out, so I get a net of two ATP that are being produced. In addition, I also have NADH that's being produced. So both these, the ATP and the NADH, are produced during glycolysis. Now, as long as I can turn that NADH over, I can continue the glycolytic path. So let me go back to our picture of glycolysis. I know the it's not. Substrate level phosphorylation forms ATP and NADH. It just forms the ATP. The NADH is also being formed in glycolysis right here. Okay, so here's our glycolytic pathway. I have my four ATPs coming off, two here and two here. I'm investing two here and here. All right, so I get a net of two ATP. 
Now, is that as near as good for each molecule of glucose when I don't have oxygen, I get a net of two ATP? Is that as good as the 30 to 32 that I can accumulate from a molecule of glucose in cellular respiration? No. no, it's not. But it does happen faster. So even though it's only like one molecule of glucose and I only get the net of two ATP, it's not like it's 30 versus 2. Glycolysis happens a lot quicker than Krebs cycle electron transport chain. When I add those on to get my 36, it's a bigger time period. So I can actually move the glucose through faster. And so even though I'm only producing two in the same unit of time, I'm actually producing quite a bit more than the same unit of time. Not as much as cellular respiration. That doesn't make any sense. Does it? So what I'm trying to say is that in a minute of time, in cellular respiration, I'm going to generate a lot of ATP. But in that same unit of time, I'm not producing 1 15th or 2 over 30 of the amount of ATP that I would if I was using cellular respiration. Because glycolysis goes quick. And so I actually can produce 2 ATP from each individual molecule of glucose, but I can metabolize more glucose in that same unit of time. So the ATPs are produced through substrate level phosphorylation, and then I get these NADHs. Now, NADH would begin to build up in the cell. Cellular, um, I'm sorry, uh, electron transport chains shut down without oxygen. So I'm not carrying those ATP, I'm not carrying those NADHs over the electron transport chain to regenerate my NADs. So without oxygen, I should begin to see NAD levels begin to drop. If I drop NAD plus levels enough, I can no longer produce NADH, and so then the glycolytic pathway would begin to shut down right here. Because I'd no longer be able to strip the, the uh, electrons off. Does that make sense? So if I can't strip those electrons off because I don't have an adequate supply of NADH, glycolysis also would shut down, which would shut down substrate level phosphorylation. So I need something to take those NADHs that are being produced to strip the electrons off to regenerate my NAD. Normally it's the electron transport chain, but without oxygen, the electron transport chain shuts down. So in walks this particular pathway. And when Krebs cycle and electron transport chain are inhibited and I'm no longer able to oxidize my NADH, I can use fermentation. which will help me to take my NADHs that are formed during glycolysis and regenerate the NAD so they can go back and pull off more electrons and I get that substrate level phosphorylation to the ATPs. So fermentation is going to maintain a consistent, it's often very low and often will be inadequate, but it's going to maintain a consistent supply of ATP because I'm going to be able to maintain the glycolytic path. So glycolysis continues, glucose to pyruvate, generating my net of two ATP, generating my NADHs, reducing NAD plus. That NAD plus needs to be regenerated in order for the glycolytic pathway to continue. So I can take my end product of glycolysis, my pyruvate, and I can convert it into lactic acid from mammals or ethanol for things like yeast. So I'm going to ferment the pyruvate to lactic acid or ferment the pyruvate to uh, ethanol if it's yeast. And in the process, I need two electrons to go from pyruvate to lactic acid. And so those two electrons get stripped off of the NADH. I re-oxidize the NADH to NAD+, which can now go back into the molecular pathway. Can I say I'm going to get there. It's ethanol. But I, I'm going to talk about the two forms. The two forms of fermentation. 
sorry. So the first form is this form, which is lactic acid. And just to put it into context for you, this is the type of fermentation that you would have. And the whole process here takes the end product of glycolysis, which is pyruvate, and it reduces that pyruvate to lactate or to lactic acid. The difference between pyruvate and pyruvic acid and lactate and lactate and lactic acid is just whether or not it's protonated. And it's fine to call it either. Um, usually we call it lactate and pyruvate because they're using the non protonated forms of the non acid and non hydrogen donating form in humans at body temperature or in organisms at body temperature. So I have to reduce lactate. How do I reduce something? What do I need? Oxidation reduction. What, what do you need to reduce something? You need an electron that has a negative charge, right? So that's why we're reducing it because we're adding in a negative. We're adding a negative. So it's just like taking three and taking away one, you reduce three to two. Pyruvates reduce to lactate. And we need a supply of electrons to do that. Glycolysis can produce that supply of electrons by forming NADH. NADH can then be used to oxidize, uh, I'm sorry, to reduce the pyruvate into lactate. So the NADH itself is oxidized because it is giving up the electron, so it becomes positive, NAD plus. And by using this NADH to NAD plus, we're dropping off the electrons, and this allows us to then recycle that NAD plus back to the glycolytic pathway at that sixth step where NADH is being generated by stripping off additional electrons as more glucose filters through the glycolytic pathway. All right, one more time. The two ATPs that are produced, how are they produced? Substrate level phosphorylation. Now we're starting to get somewhere. The NAD is recycled. Which one is recycled? The NAD plus. Back to glycolysis so that it can strip off more electrons to form the reduced form, which is NADH, to go back and reduce pyruvate to lactate. How many of you ran track in high school? How many of you were 800 meter runners? Any of you 800 meter runners? I used to be an 800 meter runner. I did a lot of 159. Two minutes of lactate, lactate fermentation. And that was about the whole life. My mile time was about 445. If I could continue the rate of production of lactate in that. 159, I could have ran, I should have been able to run, what, 358, but I could only run 445. And by the way, on my track team in high school, I was the seventh distance JD runner. There were 14 guys in front of me ran last night. So, why did I slow down by almost 47 seconds? Because there's a shift about two minutes for most of you, and you can train it out a little bit further, where you have to then begin to supply adequately, you have to adequately supply oxygen. So your body has to say, all right, we need to slow down muscle contraction so that we can maintain an adequate supply of oxygen because we're running low on ATP supplies. We can't support this level of muscle contraction through lactate fermentation as our main uh, producer of ATP. The 
other option is ethanol. This is yeast. So they have the same glycolytic pathway. So they go from glucose to pyruvate. So you saw yeast made up a, a batch of yeast in lab, put in some sugar, some glucose, and we began to generate carbon dioxide. And it was because of the, uh, the ethanol fermentation that was occurring in that particular organism. So in ethanol fermentation, you have pyruvate that's being generated from the glucose. Same 10 steps, same 2 ATP net, 2 ATP, 2 substrate level phosphorylation. You also are generating the NADH. You're reducing NAD plus to NADH. And if we can recycle that back by taking the pyruvate and converting it into something else, we can continue the substrate level phosphorylation of ATP. And so we are going to do this, but rather than just being one step, pyruvate directly to lactate, we're actually going to go through two steps. The first is to go through this molecule called acetyl aldehyde. Acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde. If you look at the chemical structure here, notice that I have a COO and here I have an H. Everything else is the same. So I'm getting rid of that carboxyl group and I'm putting a hydrogen on to bind up to that carbon to share the electron across that covalent bond. So there, the CO2 comes across. And that's what you were measuring was that CO2 production as you went through and produced acetaldehyde. So we go through and release some CO2. Now, in this step of the process here, we're not really producing ATP. We're not really regenerating an NADH. But we need to so that the glycolytic pathway can continue and we can continue to produce pyruvate that then can be taken through. So then we take acetyl aldehyde and we convert it into ethanol. And yes, this would be the same ethanol that you would find in things like adult beverages. And so this is the whole process for producing some alcoholic beverages such as uh, beer. They use the yeast that goes through this process, generates CO2 that makes it fizzy, and then increases the alcohol content by generating the ethanol. This particular step of acetyl aldehyde to ethanol is where the NADH is going to be oxidized. So we oxidize NADH to NAD. NAD plus, the oxidized NAD plus is recycled back to glycolytic enzymes. Where we can continue to take glucose to pyruvate and we can get two ATPs out. How do I get those two ATPs? Uh, All right, I can get even more people on board now. Substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. Do we have any questions on cellular respiration or on fermentation? We're about to shift gears for the remaining about 10 minutes of class. And we're going to start to talk about photosynthesis. But before we before we shift gears, do we have any other questions? Here? Okay. Uh, 
on the wrong brain, like all of this is like on the brain. What is the best way to break down each step and be able to say exactly what what for us to know? It's like all this can be an overview, but you really want us to know literally. So what, what I would start out with is just a skeleton. And I'll show you kind of what I mean by that. So let's take glycolysis. Okay? Think about where does glycolysis start? It starts with glucose. Alright? And then the glucose is taken to what? Pyrrhine. How many steps? Ten steps. Now, what are some of the things that are going to be produced? Okay, so you have how many ATP? You're going to have plus four ATP during the what phase? During the payoff, you're going to use two during the investment. So we have a loss of 2 ATP in the beginning and a 4 that come back out. What else are we going to get? Anything else besides the pyruvate and the ATPs? We're going to get an NADH. So we have NAD plus that's converted into NADH. Okay? And how many of those am I going to get? That's Krebs. I'm going to end up with two of them. And the reason I get two of them is because I get one from each of those glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate reactions as that continues. And remember, there are going to be, there's going to be that isomerization reaction. We have the split of the six carbon to the two three carbon molecules. And both of them eventually get isomerized into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and it continues through glycolysis. So if I wanted to, to draw this even better, let's draw it like this. We have glycolysis, it continues through, and then we have kind of that part there where we generate our pyruvates because of that isomerization. We have two ATP that go in, and then from here we get two ATP from this part, two ATP from this part, an NADH from here, and an NADH from here. Okay? So that's the skeleton that I'm talking about. Start off with that and then go and take your next step, which is to take your pyruvate and to bring it from, and oh, by the way, where's all this happening? So that all happens in the cytosol. Okay? Now, what do we have to do? Well, we can use the ATP directly. We have to take this, and we have to take these, and we have to transport them into where? Into the mitochondria. And really, I want to get them into the matrix. The mitochondria into this is a terrible movie. So we want to get them into the matrix, into the mitochondrial matrix. That means what? We have to transport. So don't forget our two transport mechanisms. So one of them is to transport the pyruvates. We're going to transport the pyruvate and we're going to move it into the matrix. And when we transport it in, we have a CO2 that comes off. We have another NADH that's going to be generated from our NAD plus. So some electrons there that we lose. And then we take that coenzyme A and we put coenzyme A on, sulfur containing molecule. And what do I generate? Acetyl CoA. Okay, and how many acetyl CoA would I get from each molecule of glucose? I would end up with two. And the reason I'm ending up with two is because I generated two pyruvates in glycolysis. Now, how about the NADHs that are on the cytosol? What do I need to do with them? Where are they eventually going to go? 
where do all of my NADH end up going if I have adequate oxygen supply? Yeah, what's the purpose of the NADH and the FADH2? What's the purpose? To transport electrons. Remember, I drew that picture up that looked like this. It's my big school bus. I guess it's an off road school bus with huge wheels. So, those NADHs and FADH2s, they're all electron shuttles. They shuttle electrons from different parts of the cell, different parts of the mitochondria into the electron transport chain. Is everybody sort of following me? So I have to take the NADH that's produced in the cytosol. There's going to be two of them because they're both parts of the glycolytic pathway. And they have to be transported into the matrix. When they are transported in, we're not transporting NADH. We're actually taking the electrons and we're exchanging those electrons. So really, it's not the NADH that's going in. The NADH gets oxidized back to NAD+. It's rather the electrons that move that get transported across into the mitochondria. And they can either be transported through a NADH transporter, where the electrons go to the NADH, or an FADH transporter, where the electrons go to FADH. So two different transport mechanisms. We can reduce NADH to form NADH plus, or they can take that alternative pathway where the electrons go in and they combine FAD with FADH2. So we reduce the FADH, we reduce the NAD, the FAD in the NAD plus to form NADH or FADH. So this is where that variation comes in. These just simply are now going to go to electron transport chain. Okay? So think about the skeleton for glycolysis and kind of everything that's happening there. And ignore for now glucose combines with hexokinase to form glucose 6-phosphate. Ignore that. Don't worry about those each individual steps. Get the big picture first. Do that for glycolysis. Do that for pyruvate transport. Do that for NADH transport. And then do it for the Krebs cycle. Okay? So Krebs cycle. We're going to start with pyruvate. It's going to be converted into acetyl CoA. And acetyl CoA combines with the very last molecule. These are the only two substrates that I would have you know right away oxaloacetate. It combines with acetyl CoA to form citrate. Then, how many reactions all the way around from citrate to reforming my oxaloacetate? How many reactions in the Krebs cycle? Eight reactions. And what am I producing? For each turn or rotation of the, of the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, what am I generating? Okay, so I got NADHs, and they basically come off about here, about here, and about there. And I get a total of three per pyruvate of, of molecule of pyruvate, or six per molecule of glucose. So it goes around twice because I generated the two molecules of glucose. Because if we go back and take a look at this skeleton, glucose to two pyruvates. So then I have two pyruvates available once, twice. The second time around, I accumulate another NADH in each of those points. I'm also going to have an FADH2 right around in there. And then I'm going to have, this is that, that kind of weird step where I take GDP and convert it into GTP. 
And then that GTP eventually goes and is used to generate ATP outside of the Krebs cycle. So you can really think of this whole step as just being uh, production of ATP. Now, that form of ATP production there in the Krebs cycle, what is it called? Substrate level phosphorylation. That's oxaloacetate, which is the end of the Krebs cycle, and then on top is citrate, which is the substrate end of the Krebs cycle. So again, working kind of from the scheme of, let's just talk about the skeleton, the basis, uh, the basic, and ignore the individual chemical reactions for now. Those are the only two that I think you really need to know until you start to go back and then fill in your chemical reactions. So citrate and oxaloacetate, kind of like glucose to pyruvate. And then the last step, if I have time, well, I don't really, but the last step would be just to model out the mitochondria, outer membrane, inner membrane, inner membrane space, matrix, four different complex complexes, one, two, three, four, oxygen at this side, Electrons being donated here by NADHs, FADH. To here, hydrogen concentration constantly increasing here, hydrogen concentration decreasing here as they're pumped through, and then at the very end, my ATP synthase. So start with the skeleton. Once you get the skeleton done, then go back and begin to put in the specific chemical reactions. If you only get to a point where you know the skeleton and you know the NADH is, where they're coming off and how many are being produced, about where they're coming off, how many are being produced, I give that question to you on an exam. Show me glycolysis. You map it out as the skeleton. There's seven out of your ten points. You know each interaction, there's the other three. You know half of them. There's another point and a half. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the FADH is between, uh, I think it's between turning and mailing. Let me see if I can. Like this lecture, like on YouTube or whatever, so we can go back and listen to it. Not as much the other one since we've already like taken a test on.